anyway, um, we're going to talk a little bit about you know what we're what we're up to and, and some thoughts on soil health and all that. Uh, a little bit about some of the programs we've got going on that can help you improve the health of your soils on your farm. Um, and then eventually, when we work ourselves up to it, we're going to go outside and actually look at a hole I dug and check out some soil and all that. I really want to try to get these meetings being hands-on and as much as possible farmer to farmer so even though there'll be a little more talking at this first one i'm hoping as this goes forward and hopefully we get some cooler days to do this on we'll actually spend more time out in the fields with you guys talking to each other as farmers rather than you know the agency folks talking to you i, I think sometimes we miss that that farmer to farmer communication i kind of stole this idea from the uh the grazing communities um, those guys have for years done a thing they call pasture walks where they get together on each other's farm farms and talk about what they do and some of these groups actually get very involved with each other with advising each other I know of one where they actually at the end of the year they get together and they share their financial information and how they did so you know I think there's there's a lot of potential for that kind of farmer to farmer uh, communication and work that, that I, I'd love to see getting going in this area uh, There is, I don't think there is some kind of absolute soil health measure that we can we can go with. I think it's kind of a continuum somewhere between you know really great and absolutely dead, kind of like the other things that are alive. Um, and a lot of what we're going to talk about is why we why we would want a healthier soil as producers uh, for your economic reasons, but also about the environmental benefits. And one of the things I've been asking my my fellow conservation professionals is, you know, in an era of 60-foot field cultivators, are we really still in a good position to rely on things like grass waterways for our conservation? Or are those things just going to get more and more difficult to use as this equipment gets bigger and, and all of that? And, you know, as I started dipping into this topic, I started hearing about, you know, counties out in North Dakota where they've got a 70% adoption rate of no-till and where they're taking grass waterways out because they don't need them anymore. You know, their soils soak up water like a sponge. You know, they're really able to get by with, with some of our, less of our traditional conservation practices just by doing a better job with their soil health. Um, and one of the things I, you know, I'd really like to hear from when we get Jimmy up here talking about what he does is um, how some of these more extreme years we've had, whether it's last year that was so wet, this year that's turning out so dry, how his no-till system, how he perceives his no-till system doing compared to some of his neighbors that are doing more conventional tillage. Um, this little packet I put together for you guys is, is just a few little articles on soil health. Um, you know, you kind of find a one-page description of what I think soil health is. Uh, on the back side there uh, is the announcement for our second meeting, which will be a week from today. Uh, we'll be at Bob Dykeis' farm, which is Bob joined us tonight, and that's great. Um, one of the things we're going to do tonight is a demonstration of a little, uh, a quick test which you can do yourself at home, doesn't take any special equipment. You need a little bit of water and some hardware cloth and a chunk of soil. Uh, so we'll let, uh, we'll let Bruce talk about that when we get to that. Um, the other thing is just a quick introduction to what the soil microbiology is, the different classes of these organisms and what they do for you. Um, and then this, you know, when you, when you start looking into this world of no-till, you'll bump up against the No-Till Farmer magazine pretty fast. And the nice thing about that magazine is they put a lot of it online. Um, so this is just something I pulled offline uh, about uh, Kip, Culler, or Kip Cullers, uh, who won a couple categories in the National Corn Growing Contest a few years ago. Uh, it was some pretty incredible yields. And he does this in Missouri's fescue country. And if you've ever been in this part of the world, it is some stony, sketchy soil in a big way in a lot of that, uh, a lot of that state. So I, I think we can, I think we can kind of look to this no-till as not only something for the conservationist, but also as a way to control cost and to actually improve yield, or at the very least maintain your yield while lowering your costs and therefore making money. And I think as we kind of look around this farm. I, I was really impressed not only with what I saw in the fields on this farm, but just the prosperity that this, this farm really seems to have. I mean, we've got, got some nice shiny equipment and some new buildings going up. So it's, I think it's, it's a positive example of what those can really pull off. Um, 
one of the other things we're starting to bump up against is is talk of regulation. You know, talk about the guys in the Western Lake Erie area where they're really having trouble with nutrient runoff. Uh, some of our guys around the Makatawa, you know, we know we've got some serious pollution problems, and you know, I think it's only a matter of time where if we don't get this stuff straightened out, somebody's going to try to get regulating the farmers a little more aggressively, which I can't imagine many of you are in favor of. Um, so I just encourage you to try to get ahead of the uh, of the curve on that. Um, other ways we might measure soil health, uh, you know, certainly organic matter is is a big one. Just looking at whether that organic matter is going up or down. Uh, I think a little probing with just a simple a simple tea you can weld up in the shop can tell you a lot about what's going on in your soil. And you know, there's really nothing like a shovel for getting into that soil and seeing what's really going on in there. And we'll do a little of that in a little bit. So I think. Uh, Rather than just to sit here talking more, uh, we'll get Bruce up here and he can show you what this slaking is all about. Uh, Bruce Vandenbosch is the director of the DC Director of Conservation, District, District Conservation, Conservation if that's it, uh, for Allegan County. Um, really, a, uh, really does a nice job uh, for our farmers, I think. Uh, I just got back, what, two weeks ago? Yeah, I think it was two weeks ago. Just coincidentally, Mark was putting together the soil quality uh, or soil health work group, and I was scheduled to go to a training in Minneapolis, and it was on soil health and sustainability. And it was put on by some people in our agency, soil scientists and agronomists that have been kind of working on this for about 20 years, and they finally have the platform to train some of us on it. And it was pretty eye-opening. So they, their whole message was farming uh, soil biology or, or soil livestock, they call it, all the microorganisms in the soil that form the organic matter and hold on to the nutrients and water, create infiltration. So they trained us in some, or showed us some uh, soil quality indicators. So that's what this test is. It's a, a slate test, they call it. So I bought this today at Walmart. It was like three dollars for the for the vase. It's about a three-inch diameter vase and a little hardware cloth. And I think I'm going to have to get a little bit longer hardware cloth so our actor gets all go in there full. But what happens is when you have good soil and you have the um, microorganisms that die or excrete, they form a, a glue like that holds the aggregate together. And so your aggregate will be stable. And it works nice if we would have another one from the similar soil that had been under continuous tillage. This one was under uh, one of Smogin's, I guess, no-till system. So it should hold together pretty good. And you can see it is. It's got uh, clear water where if you get a similar soil that's been continuously tilled, it breaks down because water rushes into the dry, uh, say, so if you do it yourself, you have to kind of air dry the aggregate to get the water out of it. And then what happens is the water rushes into the, the pores and creates pressure. So if you have the mac, uh, microorganisms that have created the glue, they'll hold that aggregate together. If you have one that doesn't have those microorganisms that have been basically destroyed from continuous tillage, then the water pressure will cause the aggregate to crumble. So that's just an indicator, you know, one indicator out of many that show you, you know, demonstrate how much of uh, those, uh, that soil biology is, is uh, in your soil. Yeah, we did this today at the office with somebody else's soil and they didn't do nearly as well. It basically, it didn't explode, but it fell apart pretty rapidly. So another thing you can do once it's wetted is, is uh, Crack this in half, and I don't, I don't have a knife with me, but uh, if you break it in half, then what you'll see in one that has a lot of soil biology is the water will have, uh, the aggregate will have soaked up the water. All the water has infiltrated the pores. Where one that, if it did stay together, was um, not stable, it would, um, you know, it'd be dry in the middle. So we've seen that also. But, Kind of was uh, really, uh, that was one of the first indicator um, demonstrations they showed us. It was pretty powerful when you see the one that, 
that crumbles and kind of looks like our cricks, you know, when we have the rain. <coughs> but um, there's a whole series of testing as we, you know, go along with these and you know, work with Mark. Uh, we can, you know, do more of the tests. And if you want us to come out to your farm and perform some of these or show you how to do them, we can, you know, do that as well. There's some that are more in-depth that, you know, take some lab results, but there's quite a few that can just do in our visual and don't take that long to, to run through them if you want. So, yeah. And I uh, also have a website with all the information that they gave us at the, uh, at the training, so it has the links to, to all the different aspects of soil health and running these tests and so on, so I can forward those to you also if you want. All right, any questions for Bruce? Thanks. I'm going to say just a quick word about the MEAT program, the Michigan Agriculture Environmental Assurance Program, because this is an official MEAT phase one meeting, so I have to say something about MEAT in order to talk for that. Uh, what MEEP is, is just a program to, what we, what the technician does is, does what's called a risk assessment tool. They'll come out to your farm, and over a couple hours they'll ask, a, ask questions, walk around, look at things, and essentially look for places where you might not be meeting the, the right to farm gamps, which is the, what really protects you from the frivolous lawsuits, the animal rights activists, and all that stuff that, you know, comes your way sometimes as farmers. Um, and also, of course, it's, it's just nice to have a fresh pair of eyes looking around for some of these environmental problems. And they, they certainly do train these people pretty thoroughly in, in different things, fuel and pesticide storage, manure management, and all that. Uh, I'd really like to plug especially the cropping system. There's, there's three different systems. The, the farmstead system, which will just look at your, kind of your shop and your, you know, the farmstead itself, your headquarters, and see how that does. Livestock system, which looks at your manure storage application and all of that good stuff. And then the cropping system, which I refer to as the hard one, because it really is the hard one. Um, that's where they'll go out and see how your erosion is doing, how your, your different cropping systems are, are working, whether or not you're generating a lot of runoff and all of that. Um, the nice thing about having the, the MEEP technician do all of that calculation for you is that they will, they'll handle a lot of that, that kind of informational end of it. It really is though up to the farmers to, to get done what they need to to get verified. And I, I can say that, uh, I, I think I can say that to a person that the people who get themselves verified are pretty darn proud of that when they get done with it because it, it can be a pretty long process. Um, just uh, having the guys out to do the assessment, it's free of charge, it's non-binding, it's all completely confidential, so there's not going to be, you know, somebody's not going to forward that information on to somebody else in the government or anything like that. In fact, most of the time the, the information will actually stay with you on your farm rather than go back to the office unless you want to get involved with working with, uh, with your uh, conservation district more directly and, and you choose to send it back with them. But, uh, it's something I've done for the district in the past, and it, it's a pretty, it's a pretty neat process and a pretty good program. We uh, hit a thousand farms meet verified in the state, and the governor would like that to get to five thousand farms by 2015, I believe. So certainly, uh, I think you'll see Farm Bureau, Michigan Milk, and some of those other organizations really pushing your, pushing the farmers to go out and, and do those, do these meat assessments and try it out. So that's enough of that. Uh, Kelly, did you want to say a little bit about your Rabbit River program? Yeah, just real quick. Um, one of the projects we have at the Allegan Conservation District currently is the Rabbit River Watershed Project. And um, I know some of you here are in the Rabbit River Watershed. We're in the Rabbit River Watershed right now. Um, Black Creek is a tributary to the Rabbit River. Um, what the goal of the program is is to try to reduce the amount of phosphorus inputs that are going into the Rabbit River and ultimately into the Kalamazoo. It's part of the Kalamazoo River's um, total maximum daily load for phosphorus, try to reduce the phosphorus inputs. So we are trying to work both with the agricultural and the urban community to address phosphorus. So in the urban side of things, in home lawns, um, stormwater management, those kinds of things. And then with agriculture, looking at 
um, ways to reduce erosion because that's really where phosphorus is coming from. So the kind of things that Mark is promoting with soil health will also help us reduce that erosion, keep that phosphorus in the fields where you all want it to be um, instead of running down the river, costing you money to put excess fertilizer on. Um, so what we have specifically in the program, we don't have funding to do practices that you could qualify for under the Farm Bill programs, but we can help you get through that process, working through the application process of uh, the Farm Bill programs. Um, I can work with you directly to get that paperwork done, develop that conservation plan, um, and help you try to seek that funding. We do have some funding through our project for exclusion fencing. So if you have livestock access directly to a creek, we want to get them out of there so we can provide some funding to put that fencing up. We also have some funding for stream bank stabilization projects. So again, if you have a stream that's going through your property, whether it's a natural stream or a county drain and there's bank erosion, we might be able to address that with some kind of bank stabilization project. Um, I don't think I brought any of my cards with me, but uh, if you have Mark's card, I work in the same office, um, so you can just get a hold of me there if you're interested in finding out more about the, the Rabbit River itself or how we can help you reduce erosion and keep phosphorus in your fields and help you meet your goals and meet our goals of the Watershed Project at the same time. Thank you. All right, well, let's get to the good stuff now. Uh, <coughs> when I started looking around for somebody to host this first meeting, uh, I called some people I knew and got some names from different folks, and Jimmy Smulligan's name came up a couple of times, and they said, you know, you really ought to have a meeting at Jimmy's because he's the guy who, who got me going on this no-till. He's, he's one of the guys in this area who really, you know, has that kind of in-depth knowledge and has been at, at it for a while. And very gracious when I gave him a call, said, yeah, absolutely, let's have a meeting, and he's even got air conditioning, so <laughs> he's just a heck of a guy in my book this week. So um, I'd like to just kind of turn it over to Jimmy, and I'll, you know, I'll just ask you to start, just ask you some questions about what you do here, if that's all right. Um, why don't we start with, uh, you know, how and why you got into the no-till agriculture? Well, I guess uh, we've been no-tilling Dad, my dad here, I guess I said I've learned everything from him. Probably going on, it's close to uh, almost 20 years now, right, Dad? Started off an old John Deere 7000 that actually was arms and set up for us. You know, uh, another local farmer potters here in Jamestown had you know, kind of gotten into it as well. You know, yeah, time saver, utilizing the soil better, you know, trying to manage things a little better, manage time. But I guess you've seen the benefits too to how the soil seems to, to drain better on a wet year. The water is utilized better. In a dry year, the plants seem to last a little longer. I guess we're noticing that now, even though it's still dry. But I guess trying to manage the soil better, you know. Um, it's, I, I guess I don't know what to say on what changed us or brought us to it. Um, but we've been pretty impressed with it. It takes patience. Yeah. Well, the first few years have been we're struggles. And that, that's something I sure see when I read about this, is that, you know, it's a three, four, five year process before that soil's really, really ripe for These ZAM guys are kind of the guys that got us started. Yeah. They're, they're from Marne. They could probably talk more about it than I could, yeah. actually. You'd learn more from them than me. Well, <laughs> I don't know about that. That's why we're calling it a farmer to farmer meeting, you know. And, you know, and certainly, uh, you know, feel free to jump in if, if you guys have something to add. That's that's how you've been doing that, Herb. Since we started no-till in 80, 80, 80, yeah, 83. 83? 83, and that was with a, a, a Case IH planter, international at the time, an 800 that Forest Grove was bringing out to try. That was the very first one we tried. Mm -hmm. so, so. And it was pretty successful, even yeah. though I didn't have the fertilizer. To, I mean, that's, yeah, it's come a long ways. Yeah. Well, certainly a little bit we'll take a walk and have a look at this beautiful planter out here and, and, and talk about kind of the modern no-till. Um, where do you get your information? I saw some copies of the no-till farmer around, and those of you who are here from my project, you'll be starting to get the no-till farmer in the mail here shortly, courtesy of the MacTow Coordinating Council, so Merry Christmas. Um, <laughs> Where, where else do you get information? You've got the magazines, you know, different seminars you go to, I guess trial and error, you know, 
like I said, listening to Herb and them guys, you know, there's a lot of times you dare try something or you ask them if they've tried it or it's a lot of being a guinea pig sometimes. Or, but I think that sometimes it takes, uh, do a lot of reading on different things, you know, what scenarios work and what don't. And I don't know. You know, there's not always a good cure to everything. What works here might not work down the road on a different piece of soil. Yeah. You know, cover crops, you know, I've, I'm still a little leery on certain cover crops yet just for the heavy clay. But some areas it's very well fit. So, you know, I think a lot of it goes field by field, you know, trying to manage it some. How about your owner's manuals, operator's manuals that come with your planters and all that? It's worth sitting down and reading that sucker? It isn't going to tell you a lot about your dirt, though. <laughs> <laughs> it can tell you how to fix the planter, but, you know, you gotta you got to know your dirt, too. Yeah. The yield so, monitor on the combine is probably your most important. Yeah. Yeah. You can really tool mistakes. Oh, yeah. Uh, if along, you know how to look at it. It's almost got to be the same person running the combine as running the planter mm -hmm. and doing the whole gamut to it. Really understand what goes on. You know, if you're the same person doing both, you can see what you did in the spring. A lot of farms don't do are you guys utilizing some of the newer technologies, the, the GPS and the, you know, allowing for controlled traction, any of that kind of stuff? Not controlled tracks, that's, but GPS cars auto steer, oh yeah, that's definitely, you know, yeah. we control our traffic mainly with having the tires set up right with the planet. Mm -hmm. Okay, so really get it lined up right. Mm -hmm. How much time are you spending getting your planters set up in the spring? A lot of time. winners. <laughs> yeah, you put a lot of time into it, but it seems like we're focused on more one tool, you know, that does everything for us. So it's, I guess, you know, it's a, it's a big step, you know. You don't have a field cultivator which has a plow on your desk to, to maintain. You know, the planter does everything. So I guess, yeah, we focus on that quite heavily. You know, if I mess up in the spring, it's the whole season, you know. But it, it's shot, you know. So you kind of got to be pretty particular with it. Yeah. Well, let, let's back up about four months then, because one of the things I've also heard from the no-till guys is that the planting season starts on the combine the year before. Oh, yeah. yes. And if you mess it all up the year before, you're in big trouble come next spring. So what do you do when, to, when you're harvesting to make sure you're not setting yourself up for failure that following year? A chop of corn is the first one, for corn. And for beans, have a good set, straw job. And there's, you'd be amazed how many people don't do much with a straw chopper. I mean, I, I, there's guys in our area, the, uh, the soybeans, they, they got 30 foot heads and are only leaving a 15 foot swath with the bean stubble. Mm -hmm. yeah. And also, after a rain, waiting a half a day or a day, go back to combine versus just going right at it, regardless. That makes a world of difference come spring too. And, Keeping them a little better outside. Mm -hmm. Do you think with that, with that problem of getting it spread, do you think there's a size where you, you want to stop with that corn header? Do you want to, or the, with that grain that header? header? Do you want to quit at 20 feet, or? I think you can set them pretty good. I mean, it, it yeah. depends on if the guy wants to take the time to set the, so the chopper. Takes, yeah, it just you know. takes time. I, yeah, I don't see no limit as far as grain heads go. No, no. Okay. You can usually spread it and utilize it. You know that trash that you're putting back out there is giving bacteria to all the soil. You might as well utilize it. It can help keep moisture there. The decay of it, you know, there's benefits to having it there, but to bring it down good too. Good. So that is that the key is that in the fall you're trying to make sure that the stuff that you harvest, whatever's left over, is broke down really good, and then on top of the soil. That's the starting process. Yeah, that's the start. Well, we've all been working with VT tools on corn stalks too. Mm -hmm. So we all got different ones, mm -hmm. but they're, they're all, the they all is all pretty it. similar. Yeah. I, you brought up something kind of interesting about the 60 foot field cultivators and waterways. Mm -hmm. The right VT tool can go right through a waterway without it hurting it. Hmm. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. I run a Great Plains turbo till, he's running a Salford RTS, and both of them you can run right through a waterway and it not hurt it. With it down, and it will not hurt. There's a, I guess there's VT tools and there's VT tools, you know, some of them certainly look a lot more aggressive than others, you know, is so there. We run ours down through the water with some. But they don't hurt nothing then either? Huh? They don't hurt nothing. They don't tear them out. They don't tear them out. Yeah. 
That it makes it a little better. Yeah, it depends on the damage. If we, you know, we're dumb enough to do damage the fall before and mm -hmm. run them up, you know, when we should have been patient yeah, and waited a little bit. Okay, yeah. I kind of wondered about that. With no, it seems so. so weird. I think our, the land on the BT is probably the heavier one of the units. Maybe that's probably the downfall. Maybe of that one, it cuts. You know, it cuts the trash nice. Mm -hmm. I guess, like you'd say, going back to the fall, that's where we've last fall we noticed where maybe we shouldn't have been in the fields. It was too wet. Trying to cut the trash. You know, get in the topsoil profile to help the decay process, but it was too wet. We should have quit, parked it, you know. Because then we had to come back through in the spring and either fix it or yeah, fix so our mistakes. Too, it was too wet, huh? Yeah, it doesn't cut good, you know, it leaves the field too rough, you know. Stay old. Yep. Yeah. It's not worth wasting the fuel and the damage are done. And that was our experience this past fall. We tried to run on a few acres and then it just got too wet to even run that. And it actually turned out better to run it ahead of the bean planter this spring as opposed to the stuff in the fall. That's what we see in our fields right now. Because the fields that we did last fall, we just went in and planted them, and they didn't turn out near as nice. And I attribute that that we started compacting that soil last fall already. You know, my uh, agricultural mentor told me that every corn farmer ought to have a boat and ought to sit in it for most of the month of April until they can't stand it anymore and then go plant corn. Do you guys, do you feel like as no-tillers, you know, you, you need to be a little more patient sometimes or do you feel like because you've got that soil quality you can get a jump on your neighbors a little bit in some of these wetter years? You know, think, think back not so much this past year but the year before that when it was wet, wet. I've always said you don't know the optimum planting window until it's passed. <laughs> this spring was earlier than what I thought it was. It didn't help you much, does it? <laughs> <laughs> well, that hindsight is 2020, isn't it? This so always goes from my mind. Dad said that years ago, you know, usually if you see the neighbor out chisel plowing or doing tillage, you know, you should wait two days. <laughs> you know, and it, not, not, I'm not picking on a neighbor, but I mean, anybody yeah. doing tillage <coughs> with the no till, you just you need to be patient, you know. One day makes a world of difference. Oh, it's one amazing. Day. Yeah. One day, one day. It's yeah. amazing. But and sometimes you just got to be, patience is a big thing. You know, when you think you should be out there, the sun shine, it's nice, and it's like, why well, is the planter in the shop? Well, you can't always be patient, but you but should. What's yeah. interesting is the people, the chisel plowing guys out there, by the time their planter gets to the field, you've already got your field planted. Because mm -hmm. they've got so many trips they're doing across the field. Right. Where do the cattle fit into a no-till system? They're right. manure, huge. It's a big benefit. It's also a, a hurdle, you know, utilizing the manure. But, you know, to feed the soil, to feed the microbes in the soil is good. We've seen a lot of benefit spreading on the corn stalks to maybe speed up the process of the de decomposing them, benefiting the soybeans on our rotation. Uh, but manure is a big, a big value. You know, feeding the soil, you know, to feed it to speed up the breakdown of the trash and the residue. Feeding earthworms, you know. You mentioned cover crops a little bit. Do you fellas do any cover cropping? Just dabbled a little bit. Radishes last year. How'd you like that? That was pretty good, but you can't go by what the what was it? You didn't end up planting. Mm -hmm. What we was told didn't really work. You can't. What they said the way to do it. We were using manure doing it. You know they were saying they they recommended the tillage radish. That sold us the seed to pl um, to plant it and then spread manure on it, and that would have been better. Spread manure and then plant it, and also they said to let it winter kill, and that that was that would be a real big no no. You want to kill them in the fall? Oh really? When it was too easy this year, though, you think that it bothered? Well, we just we we actually learned this from watching a neighbor. We didn't kill them. We killed ours. Okay. But if you didn't kill it, you had a mouth come spray. All the, volu all the weeds and volunteer weed. Mm -hmm. If you were doing, then we did it behind wheat. Mm -hmm. So it, you, yeah, you, you gotta kill it in the fall. Okay. You gotta round, round up. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. No matter what, so even if you're not no tilling, I don't care what you're doing, you gotta kill them in the fall. It's quite a route to destroy the yeah, rut and volunteer weed. And, yeah. Okay. That's all my questions. Any of you guys got questions for these fellas? This is what we're here for. Yeah, with um, what, 
how big a planters are you using and is there limits to width because you don't have enough weight per row or can you make some comments on weight and or have you been doing it long enough that your grounding is hard and all that? No, I, I, I think we're using less aggressive planters than when we started. Yeah. Yeah, we've gotten rid of a lot of iron on our planter when we started no tilling. We've gone back to more basics, but the soil, I think the soil profile has gotten more mellow. You know, uh, yeah, the planter, we've not had much trouble getting the seed in the ground, even on the harder clay. But a lot of it's timing, you know. And there's a lot of times where I could plant this field, the field next to me is not ready, so then I go down the road and plant another field, and then I run down and plant another field. And that doesn't always work either for some bigger guys that they're in an area and they got to stay there. But we do a lot of jumping around as the fields are ready, but... Uh, but we've made our own planter less aggressive and I could still go into a first year no-till situation and get a good, uh, you know, good planting job, seed and soil contact, and depth control. That's probably attributed a little bit to the way these planters have evolved a little bit too. Mm -hmm. You know, we started out with an old 7,000 planter with springs on it, now we're up to the pneumatic system. Before the planter ever gets the field, if you let a field green up and spray it, it don't matter the planter, you're not going to get it in the ground. If, if it, what was that? If you let a field get green in the spring. With weeds or grass. With weeds or grass, you're not going to get seed in the ground regardless of the planter. If you don't, that's the, next, that's the second most important piece of equipment other than the tractor to the planter to spray. Yeah. First. Is first. Yeah, we've right. always I mean, the, the sprayers are first. You think of first. Planters. Everybody thinks they got to the plant. Well, sprayers needed to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really bad. For, I, I, I'd say equal. If, yeah. Equal. You guys feel like you need to own your own planters, so you're not waiting on the co-op to come out and get you it mean done. Sprayers or yeah, sprayers. Excuse me. Oh yeah, you yeah. got to own your own. Yeah. Huge difference. Yeah. How much difference has the Roundup Ready crops made for you guys? Well, it's made weed control so easy. Mm -hmm. It's just flat out. It's just made it easy. I think just even tillage or no till, but it's it's giving you more options. You know, if you don't, you know, to come through in a safer manner. But no, it's been huge. You know, it the is. benefits of it. It is amazing how many people haven't learned yet, though, that you got to spray weeds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, residual. <laughs> <you know>, residual. <laughs> yeah. What did you say? How many people still don't know you got to spray the weeds small in a roundup ready? I just yes, just last week I had somebody tell me they, they're starting to see weeds. They're not quite big enough yet to spray. <laughs> I, uh, I'm just a gardener. I'm not a farmer. <laughs> but, you know, if I'm not out there when those, those weeds are like that, you know, then, then it's a big struggle after a week or two, you know, once they get starting big. You know, I mean, yeah, on that little small scale in my little tiny garden, it's the same thing, you know. I don't, I'm gonna, I'm, it's going to be interesting for me to try to figure out how I can apply something this to such a small little space because we're not talking big equipment or anything, but I'm going to be thinking it through. Right now is when you can tell people that didn't spray fast enough. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah, right now. I think corn takes it, beans take it hard too, but we've noticed that corn quicker, you know. Corn in wheat competition is never good, but mm -hmm. I don't think we realize how bad it affects the beans though through the competition. But like you see it now, they take a lot of moisture away. That's the biggest thing we're noticing right away, where the weeds got too big. But even with the Roundup system, as good as it is, we are not relying 100% on Roundup either. And I think all three of us here are all putting residuals down on corny and beans too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are you using any headline or fungicide? Messing around with any of that? Playing more with it. Oh, yeah. yeah. We had it on a corn last year. I don't know, it's hard to see. Beans it really bad. Beans have seen some pretty yeah. good advantage in anywhere. Last year what we did was yeah, Gary even weighed some of them, you know. Decent yields. You know, health of the plant. You can notice the longevity of the health of the plant. If I slowed the combine down a little bit where we stripped the fields, trying it because they were greener, healthier. Beans were whatever, but yeah, I think there's more room to play there. Talk to us about how you guys manage fertility on your farm. Of course, you're not stirring that soil up much, so you know, are you seeing you know, zones of fertility or infertility, or you, do you sample at different depths to check for things like that? Or? 
we've been, we've, I guess we're starting to learn better at that. I guess getting a grid sample, you know, and starting with the basics, you know, finding what we've got. He's trying to get the pH up to where it needs to be. We haven't done much grid applying with potash or phosphorus or potash levels. We've kind of been a pattern of putting potash down in the fall for the following season for our beans and flip flop every year that way. But I guess trying to get a grid sample to get the fields a little more consistent, keeping the calcium levels up. It seems like we noticed a really hard clay. The calcium isn't where it needs to be. The soil is very tight. What are you trying to feed it? What are you shooting for for a base saturation? I don't know what to tell you on that one. No. What should I be shooting for to see good? <laughs> you know? I would say 70. I'd say 65 to 75. Mm -hmm. For calcium, around 15% magnesium and no more than 5% potassium. I know. Do you guys have any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's kind of what we're trying to shoot for also. But the one thing we've noticed also on our fields that have been in long term no till is we're not making up as much nutrient makeup. You know, as we soil test these fields, we don't seem to be applying as much as we used to. Out of new fields, you know, that are depleted out or, you know, they're washed out. I think we're retaining the nutrients and recycling back into the soil better as opposed to a conventional system. Yeah. Well, and I think one thing that a lot of folks don't realize is how much you know, phosphorus, potassium, and things like that are actually still in that soil even if they're not turning up on your soil test because that soil test is measuring plant available phosphorus, plant available potassium. So if you've got an active soil biology that's really, you know, rocking and rolling out there and you know, chewing on those rocks for you, if you will, that's actually going to release some of those minerals over time. So you guys may have just been at it long enough. You've got enough soil biology working for you, you don't need it. And the real thing that it makes a huge difference on, difference on is nitrogen. How do you manage nitrogen? Are you putting less on over time on your corn, or? I don't know if we've been putting less on, but the yields seem to be getting better with the same amount of nitrogen. So we've been noticing. I think, like you said, what we used to aim for maybe a pound per bushel has maybe gone down to eight tenths of a pound per yeah. bushel. You know, and what it takes to get what we the yields have been coming off. We went to splitting it more though. Yeah. I mean, we're we're splitting it three ways. We're putting whether it's residual, we're putting ten gallons on. And then with the planter, we're putting 10 gallons on, and then putting, say, 25 to 30 side us. So yeah. I think it's splitting it. And, but with what you put on with the planter, it's pretty important to get it just right. Yeah. Is it split it in two bands, one along each side, or? No, just on one side. Okay. Yeah. We've just been on one side. And like, so we used, to, we used to put everything down with the planter, but you get a wet spring, or you don't know if you leach some away. But I think coming out later, Helps the plant health later in the season too. A bigger, that's where we've seen a benefit. Yeah, that's where you're talking bigger planters. Putting more fertilizer on with bigger planters isn't really easy either. Pretty soon, all you're doing is pumping the fertilizer. fertilizer. Yeah. What form of what forms of fertilizer are you using? Especially nitrogen. Twenty eight percent. Twenty eight percent. Okay. Any of you use anhydrous for anything? We tried super. I tried super U last year or uh, slow release. Year in, kind of not real sold on that technology yeah. right now. We even vertical tilled on corn, corn on corn, and it still was. It was one day, one turned out well, and then the next day the co -op, the co op was spreading it, and it was windy, and we literally had cornfields waving. Sure, you know, the 28% is there and you know it's there. That's pretty hard to beat. Okay. Well, I'm about run out of questions. You fellas got anything? Or? I had one, one thing back. <laughs> on manure, spreading manure too close to planting time on no tills. Not real great. Mm -hmm. But I've seen a lot. You can see a lot of disadvantages with that. Especially pen manure for some reason. Well, yeah. Or it's probably wet, sloppy manure. Of course, then you got a wet streak, and you plant through it. And it's yeah, just do wet, and that stir up, and then you have this in the field where you haul. Mm -hmm. But yeah. yeah, you get down to the last field, you got to take a haul manure somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then you sacrifice. And I mean, it seems like if manure can sit for say two weeks before you plant into it, then it's fine. Yeah, that, within a week or so, it's just too hot or something. Yeah, like too much know. nitrogen, too active right away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you you think you're burning the plants a little bit? Yeah. Or? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Any experience with uh, strip 
tillage or zone and sorry. Yeah, we tried it for two years this past spring. We didn't do it just because the time, cons you know, it consumes time and everything. It was easier just to run the RTS or a turbo till ahead of the planter and manage our nitrogen that way. And we've got quite stony ground and everything too in the setup that I'd have. I was bringing a pretty good crop of rocks up where we did have them cleaned up. It works well. It really does, but it's man it takes a lot more management. That's and the same uh, guy that's running the strip tiller, or the same guy, the guy running the planter's got to run the strip tiller. That was a pass then that you make in the fall or in the spring. We were making spring pass just because we're our hills and everything that we got, yeah. but I'm did. I haven't abandoned the idea yet, but I just put it on the shelf for this past growing season here. So you're talking the, at least the articles that I read got the advantage of that if you have this strip that might be a little bit darker uh, and be a little bit more absorbent so that in the spring. Yeah, well you, there's attachments we put on the planter, Jim's got them and that's uh, doing about the same effect. Okay. Just a, whatever, four or six inches or whatever. Yeah. Had, we're just trying to clean, just Get sweep the, the residue off the side. You guys said you were doing vertical tillage, right? What is your, how often do you do that and how deep do you go and what kind of implement do you use? Like, we're to do all, all of us have a different machine. We've got a land all of BT. Uh, it's more of a straight blade. Looks like a disc scenario with a rolling basket in the back. I guess out of having it the last couple of years, we found a lot of benefit going in the fall, trying to cut up the trash after the combine, at least help it size it better so it can break down, the stalks can de decompose better. We've also been using it ahead of the bean planter in the spring, you know, to help break up the trash, crack that top soil profile. We try to stay pretty shallow, you know, inch, <coughs> inch and a half. Don't want to get below the seed depth. So we're planting into hard, you know, undisturbed soil. No tilling in your bean stubbles, wheat stubbles, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we'll no-till. Most of the soybeans will come through if we come ahead with that, but like with the corn planter, we probably no-till most everything. And the bean stubble, I hate to touch bean stubble. It's beautiful no-tilling. Leave it alone, it's mellow, it's soft. Corn on corn isn't too bad if the stalks are left standing. You know, you should have a pretty good chance of planting through that. I think the fields dry off better too when you ET in the fall. Yeah, they do. They, they dry out a little bit quicker, mm -hmm. so you get, get out there sooner, it seems like. But like zone builders were also considered vertical tillage too. Mm -hmm. and are you running a zone builder? Yeah, we haven't. Last fall we didn't get any done. We've got a Ralston zone builder. It's more of our subsoiler, you know, just to, yeah. to break the hard pan. We didn't get any last fall. It was too wet. You know, and if it's too wet, you could better park it because you're going to more damage. Right. You know, when it's dry, it really does a nice job of shattering that profile. But and you can plant over it. And you can tell when you're right on where you subsoil the planter, will, it pulls hard. So if you subsoil, mm -hmm. if you do a field once, would you ever go back in there and do it again? We've done them before. You know, it depends if you mess them up in the fall. You know, not being patient, too wet. You know, it's it, some stuff you'd read. They talk about doing it twice. You know, every 15 inches, basically. The you, know, you shouldn't have to again either. It's a fussy tool. Yeah, you can do it wrong and really not do any benefit. You know, if you're pulling, it's pulling hard. You think oh, I got to shallow it up because I can't pull it. You're not doing any good. Right. You know, you're not breaking through that hard pan. I guess that's where we've seen it. Yeah. So it is a benefit. Too much difference in uh, vertical tillage tools. Like, uh, like, a, did you compare it to like a McFarland or? Mm -hmm. You've got Larry's got a McFarland, right? McFarland. Yeah. Well, you got a McFarland. Mm -hmm. So there's basic same concept, different. Probably along the same concept, yeah, just to uh, size the trash, you know, to help break it down to cut it up better for decomposition. You know, I think they've all got the same concept. You know, the yields are getting stronger, we're planting thicker, the hybrids are hardier, they don't need to pull us, we're trying to break them up a little better. You know. But yet not want to smother the soil either and just put this layer on top, you know, if we can get them just kind of buried in that top few inches so it can break down quicker. You know, stock choppers, I think, are a bad idea you know come through in the fall with a chopper and leave it because then it's just a blanket on your it's field wet. and it's piles yeah and it's wet and the ground's cold so we've had pretty good luck with it so far with the vt trying to
cut up trash. Cut up trash, and then it just gets it in the top two to three or whatever. Yeah, I don't even like to go that deep. You know, in the fall, if you're running two inches, maybe. You know, but in the spring, pretty shallow. Mm -hmm. you know, and go just, like crazy. That's what they claim. Yeah, <laughs> whatever horse you got pulling it, if you can pull it, so <laughs> or if you stay in the seat. Dad does quite a bit of that in the spring too. And <clears throat> but you don't want to. We don't want to go ahead of the planter more than about a half a day. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. <coughs> you, you don't want that dirt to dry up. When you come with a planter, it's got to be a good seed bed and it's got to break yeah. to put the seed in the ground, you know? Yeah, you kind of open it up, the planter up, lay it back down. So you got to follow each other, kind of. If you're too Please. close, it's bad. You know, if you're right behind the planter, it's not good either. Yeah. Then you let, you know, it'll pack down the concrete and you'll see the results. They, they are the tillage of the future. I mean, at the field elevators are starting to get obsolete. Yeah. I mean, even for just finish, they just do such a better job of finishing, even if you're using it as a finish tool. Yeah. Compared, I mean, it's just, it's smooth. One well, thing I noticed is it doesn't seem to do the leveling, you know, like if you have ruts or something, yeah. you know, from the No, you, yeah, the they won't, they're not aggressive. It doesn't do any that. leveling. It's like not made to move them. dirt. No. Or made, it's, made to, it's not really made to move dirt, it's, it's just, just made to cut shops. that stock and yeah. then... Yeah. yeah, if you got ruts, you got a real, really rough field, you got to hit it with something else yeah. first. So you can use it as a finish tool pretty easily. They, they are good that way. You know, along those lines, talking about ruts, fellas, what do you do in the fall? I mean, besides the obvious, stay off it when you should. But what are you guys running tracks on your grain carts? Do you keep the grain size of the grain cart relatively small as compared to some of these monsters guys are running now? Yeah, I'm the right guy running a grain cart. Not anybody run your grain cart. Yeah. You have the problems with that. So run it slow, don't get it bouncing when you're running across make sure, the fields. Well, make sure a guy's not turning the middle of the field. That's the better one. Okay. And making sure they run the full length of the field to that. And instead of putting two full dumps on one dump and having them dump, that's a big one. And like I say, they, they come with big enough tires. They should. And the ones nowadays do. Yeah, big tires on the combine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Make sure you get the biggest tires you can on your combine too. Tracks worth it. If it gets wet, you you. I mean, yeah, you like I to stay mean. off the field, but you got to draw the line somewhere. Yeah, you got to get yeah. it off too. So. Mm -hmm. If your ground's in good shape, you don't need to. You, you don't need to. No, no it's but pretty surprising. I mean, it's more been known to a long time. You know that it's amazing how much the, the water drains better. You know how the soil firms up better. You know it's it's quite a difference. You know. When you don't go down to the plow depths, no, like you used to when you we, used to plow and stuff. We have one field. I remember uh, took out a tree line. That was by Harold, which was a plow where that tree line was and. Combine the beans, two wheel drive, got in the work chisel plow, wet fall, and I couldn't get through it. Couldn't get through it. You drive until you spin down and back up. And you drive out where we didn't work it, and solid as a rock, you barely leave a cleat. Mm -hmm. you know, but then I've been no till for quite some time. You know, it's, <coughs> but it takes time, you know, let them roots you know, drain the soil. So. But after you no know, till so many years, the, the amount of earthworms you see on top are huge. Mm -hmm. I mean, you take a little piece of manure that you spread in the fall, that big, not account to have 15 mm -hmm. worms on there, under there at least. They do a lot of drainage for you. Mm -hmm. you know, they're doing a lot of your work breaking down the microbes, feeding them. What's the uh, what's the enemy of earthworms? What fertilizer or spray or anything like that? Yeah, the the plow. Plow. <laughs> yeah, probably yeah, probably yeah, plowing yeah. first and anhydrous. Uh, so yeah, anhydrous. I would put on there. Highly acidic soil, if you know if your lime's really out of whack. Earthworms don't like sand all that well either, right? <laughs> I'm on pretty sandy ground. Now I only pasture. I don't do a lot of row crops, but I noticed, you know, I think it's kind of like some what the steam is. You know, we started having that manure out on the ground. There was food there, and after a couple of years, I see quite a few more earthworms than I used to. But I guess I would agree if, if they had to pick, I think they'd like a nice loamy soil too, just like the rest of us. I was told years ago that earthworms go, back in the winter, they go down. How far do they go down? Four feet? Or yeah, below the, frost level? The, yeah, they're, they're basically headed below the frost. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was interesting when I was digging the hole I, today, 
wasn't a whole lot of worms in the upper profile, and I actually found more as I was getting deeper and deeper. And, but there was a little moisture in there. You know, another thing I, I guess I learned years ago is that the earthworms not only are providing tillage, but they do a nice service by dropping dead for you in the middle of summer and providing a little bit of nitrogen too. So I think there's they're providing a lot of services for uh, for the farmer. So. Other questions, or you guys want to get a drink here and head outside, go look at some iron. Everybody loves iron, don't they? <laughs> Yeah. Okay.